Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Titus chapter 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men may be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. And if we stopped right there and thought about just that first two verses in Titus, we should, I believe, be struck by something quite remarkable. The, verse, the first two verses of Titus, chapter 2, connects soberness, seriousness, patience, and faith and love with sound doctrine. The point I want to make here before we begin is the text is crystal clear. We do not conform ourselves to the Word of God. That's a myth. The truth is that, is that that is law, not grace. What these first two verses in Titus show us is, is that these characteristics that surface in the believer's walk depend upon sound doctrine. And rather than us conforming our lives to the text, the text transforms our lives. Big difference. Verse 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, uh, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That's easy to do, isn't it? You know, I've talked a lot about over the past six years about how the, the flesh profits nothing. What is so remarkable to me about all of this is the transforming power of the Word itself to do in us what we could not possibly, possibly do in and of ourselves. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Well, that's not a high, it's not a very high calling, is it? In doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. Not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. If doctrine doesn't govern our lives as Christians, then what does? And yet today we live in an age in which sound doctrine, well, doctrine itself is considered to be divisive, which is kind of odd given the fact that 
That's its purpose. God's grace brings deliverance in our lives. We're past the, the whole point of justification. That, that issue has been completely settled. We're now looking at how we are to then live based upon the truths that we see in the Word of God. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation. Just stop right there. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Notice what the text doesn't say. The commandments of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Doesn't say that. The law of God that brings salvation. Doesn't say that. The, all the self-effort, the, the, the strenuous uh, human performance, uh, you know, just sort of like, you know, just be kind of like the army. Be, you know, just be all you can be, you know. I don't know why we treat the word grace so loosely. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, denying, denying. Well, that's that's not a that's not a it's not a very high calling, is it? I mean, that's that's easy to do, right? We we all know how easy that is to do. We should live soberly, righteously. Wow, what a high calling that is. Live righteously. Dearly beloved, how do, you, how do you do that? How do you live righteously? Well, according to the truth of the Word of God, is you live as who you are. God made you righteous. He declared you righteous. He couldn't declare you righteous unless He had made you righteous. You stand in the righteousness of God. All righteousness is of the Lord. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves. That righteousness was imputed to us. It's based upon the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are to continue in walking in truth. It's a righteousness that's based on faith, not self effort, not the burdensome dictates or mandates of the law, which was never given to the church to begin with. I love Titus 2. It's showing us just where the source of our deliverance lies. And it doesn't lie within ourselves. And there's so many Christians out there struggling and hurting because they think that it does. It doesn't. That we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Well, man, that's, those aren't, that's not a very high calling, is it? The, the point that I really want to lay upon you heavily here is, is that God's Word conform, conforms us. We don't conform to God's Word. You know, we've put the cart before the horse, like just about everything else today. We put the cart before the horse. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Marvelous, marvelous verse. who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity. Justification. And purify unto Himself. That's sanctification. That's our walk. And purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now don't get confused. We're not looking at human merit here. We're not looking at your good works. Zealous for good works. What works? 
the works that we should walk in, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We're zealous, we're enthusiastic. Over what he did. We're, we, are, we are infatuated. We are, gosh, I could think of a great number of adjectives. We are caught up in the magnificent glory of what Christ has done in and for us. And the text says, It purifies. Doctrine purifies us. And it closes the second chapter. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Okay? Right away at the closing verse, I mean, first thing we must, are forced to accept or realize is that we will be de despised. If you go around preaching that this book has actually has the power to conform our lives, transform our lives, that we don't conform our lives to this book, well, we... Uh, we can expect to be despised. I think with everything going on today, I think it's become quite clear, uh, even um, um, within Christianity, uh, among Christians and non-Christians alike, that we are living in unprecedented times. Any way you, you cut it, any way you slice it, any way you look at it, I don't care what background you're from, I don't, know, I don't care what persuasion you're from, what background, that, what your background is, I think I'm just almost willing to just to say I know that our, our Lord's return is, is at the door. Uh, many went back to sleep after the Revelation 12 sign. Well, nothing happened. I'm wondering when all of the Revelation 12 sign deniers are going to apologize. More Christians than ever before, including non-Christians, think that we've about reached the end of the age. 53 years now since Hal Lindsey's uh, uh, the late book, the, the late great planet Earth, which strangely was published uh, within the same time frame as the awakening of the dragon, uh, to use that phrase, uh, the beast system, the ungodly, anti-Semitic nature, hatred toward Israel, uh, which extends beyond Israel toward God's people and every institution and in every fabric of America. There's sort of a competition going on here. First, I want to talk a little bit about our our love for our Jewish friends. As Bible-believing Christians, we have a great love for the Jewish people. The Jews are God's chosen people. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 says, For thou, Israel, art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, 
above all the peoples, above all the peoples who are upon the face of the earth. And that's who they want to wipe off the face of the, the earth. God used the Jewish people in a, in a very special way to give us this book that we so neglect. He used uh, such men as Moses, David, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the list goes on, to speak for him. You know, we have those words in the book that I'm holding, that I'm looking at here, God's Word. It was to the Jewish people that God gave His law, which is a reflection of God's holy and absolute character. The law was never given to the church to begin with. What did we receive instead? Christ, the very fulfillment of the law, living inside you. You ever, you ever, you ever had something like you know, just something inside something, and that, and you just didn't know how to get it out. I remember having uh, some dirt in my uh, gas tank or something. You know, once I had to flush it out. You, know, you, just, you don't know how to get it out, or maybe something stuck in the drain. You don't know how to get it out. We have the very fullness of the triune God living inside us. That's every. Every, every single believer on earth living inside them. Christ, the fulfillment of the law, living inside us who were never given the law. That ought to ring a bell of some sort. How do we then manifest the very life of Christ as we continue to await for His glorious appearing. How is that life manifest in and through our lives? Very important question. Because we know that we can't conform ourselves to this book. That's not, that's not how it works. It's, it's not just read it and do it. Uh, you know, it says this, do this, so I'm going to try my best. Folks, that's the flesh. And yet that is the majority of modern Christian teaching from the pulpits across the land today. No, the law wasn't given to the church. It was given to Christ. It was given to Christ, the very one that Israel refused. Does Israel have a divine right to the land that they're now, you now see them fighting for? Don't, don't make the mistake they're fighting for someone else's land. Of course, Israel has divine rights to the land of Israel because God Himself promised this land to Israel in the covenant which He cut with Israel. Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Okay? Not something that's very popular among non-Jews. We know that from Genesis 15, 18. And because of this, I, here at Blessed Hope Forever, fully support the nation of uh, Israel and their rightful claim of the land. Their homeland. Because uh, their cause is just. God has a wonderful future for the Jewish people. This involves the Fulfillment of all of the kingdom promises found in the writings of the Hebrew prophets uh, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, many other, many others. I'm convinced that the day is coming when Israel will dwell safely in the land to enjoy a peace and prosperity such as 
it, the nation of Israel has never had. According to the prophets, Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Wrap, wrap your mind around that. It's going to happen. And Israel will be the pride of every nation. Micah chapter 4, Zechariah chapter 8. Kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? But it, folks, this could happen, all happen in very short order. I've done this many times, but once again, I want to give you a comparison, a contrast between Israel and the church. Israel is a nation chosen by God and sustained by covenant promises. Mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 7, not all individuals in this chosen nation are saved. That's Romans chapter 9. The church, however, is a called out assembly of believers who have been baptized into the body of Christ. Every member of the body of Christ is saved, though there are multitudes of professing Christians who may not be saved. 2 Timothy 2. Israel traces its origin to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob being the father of the 12 tribes. The church traces its origin to the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when believers were first placed into the body of Christ. In God's program for Israel, His witnesses comprised a nation, Isaiah 43. In God's program for the church, His witnesses are among all nations, Acts chapter 1. God's program for Israel centered in Jerusalem and will again center in Jerusalem during the tribulation and during the millennium. God's program for His church began in Jerusalem and extended to the uttermost parts of the earth. The church is identified with the risen Christ, not with any earthly city. The hope and the expectancy of Israel was earthly, centering in the establishment of the kingdom of the Messiah foretold by Jeremiah, Isaiah. The hope and the expectancy of the church is heavenly, centered in the glorious appearing of Christ to take His people to heaven. God's purpose and program for Israel was revealed in the Old Testament Scriptures God's purpose and program for the church was not revealed in the Old Testament, but was revealed by the New Testament apostles and the prophets. Israel's history, which is in view in Daniel 9, the 70 weeks or 490 years, involved animal sacrifices. These years will include the tribulation. Israel's millennial history will involve the same. The church... Uh, its history does not involve animal sacrifices. Uh, Messiah's sacrifice is commem commemorated by means of the Lord's table, whether we come together and we feast together on His Word. Because our Lord was that sacrificial lamb and we feast upon Him. Israel's history, which is in view in Daniel 9, the 490 years, including also the tribulation, involves a temple in Jerusalem. The same will be true in the millennium, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. During most of the church age, there is no Jewish temple in Jerusalem. In this age, God manifests His glory in His believers, both individually and collectively, designating them as His temple. Uh, this is accomplished by the indwelling ministry of God the Holy Spirit. You are not a temple. And we are not, as Christians, are not a bunch of little temples running around. We are all members of the one temple, and that is Christ. Israel's history, which is in view in Daniel 9, the 490 years, involves a priesthood limited to the sons of Aaron and excluding most Israelites. The same applies to the millennium when priests uh, of Aaron will serve in the temple. But during the church age, every true believer is a priest. You're a priest, okay? Don't know if you knew that or not. We don't typically, Christians don't typically walk around talking, talking about 
you know, themselves as priests or, or even looking at themselves as such. But whereas Israel had a priesthood, the church is a priesthood. Israel's history, which is in view in Daniel 9, will terminate with the coming of the Messiah to the earth to establish His kingdom, His kingdom reign. The church's history will end at the rapture of the church when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. 1 Thessalonians 4, Romans 11. Now, if you're not pre-trib, sorry about that, but those are the facts. During Israel's history, which also includes the tribulation, the ethnic makeup of the world is bipartite. It's the two parts, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, this division of all people into Jews and Gentiles will also apply to those in the millennial kingdom in natural bodies, but during the church age, from Pentecost to the rapture, the ethnic makeup of the world is tripartite. Three parts. Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The church being composed of saved Jews and Gentiles united together in one body. During Israel's history from Sinai to the millennial kingdom, excluding the church age, uh, Israel's role in the world will be characterized by priority. That is, they, they'll have a leading role as God's chosen people. We know that from Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Matthew, Zechariah. But during the church age, Israel's role in the world will be characterized by equality, Jews and Gentiles united together in one body to bear uh, testimony to a risen Christ. Male Jews were circumcised as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Believing Jews were circumcised in the heart. Believers of this age enjoy an internal circumcision not made with hands. Colossians 2, Philippians 3. Israel was under the law of Moses as a rule of life. The church is under the, the not under the law. It's under a new, a new principle, a new, the new creation rule. Galatians chapter 6, which basically amounts to grace. Unbelieving Jews were physical children of Abraham and uh, spiritual children of the devil. Every believer in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, is a child of Abraham and a child of God. Romans 4 and Galatians 3. That does not mean that church age believers are Israelites. Israel was to observe the Sabbath day uh, Sabbath observance will also take place in the tribulation and in the millennium. But the church is to be diligent to make every effort to enter into God's rest. Hebrews chapter 4. This is a daily activity. Every day is a Sabbath. So, you know. Membership into the Jewish nation was by birth or by becoming a proselyte, proselyte, you know, a convert to Judaism. Membership into the church is by the new birth accomplished by who? You? No. The baptizing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Believing Jews prior to Pentecost, uh, uh, believing Jews during the tribulation, and believing Jews during the kingdom reign of Christ are not members of the body of Christ. Believing Jews and Gentiles from Pentecost to the rapture are members of the body of Christ. Israel's place of worship centered in Jerusalem and, and that will also be true in the tribulation and in the millennium, millennium uh, kingdom age. The church's place of worship is where two or three are gathered together in my name. Matthew 18, John 4. Christ is in the midst of His churches. Revelation chapter 1. Israel's likened to the wife of Jehovah, often an unfaithful wife. Read the book of Hosea. The church is the beloved bride of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Revelation 19, 7 through 8. Who will stand before Him Holy, righteous, blameless, spotless, 
Ephesians chapter 5. I think that we, we, God's people, you know, whether you're speaking of Israel or the church, and you could extend that to just the, the Gentile nations, you know, Gentiles in general, all the other nations, the, the even go as far as to say all, every single last soul on, the, on earth. But I, I, I'm just going to, be very conservative here and say that I think that God's people are playing a magnificent role in bringing about, ushering in these final last days. If you have not yet come to realize that the conflict which we are witnessing now and have been for several decades, uh, really uh, much of the last century, including uh, the first 23 years of the 21st century, if you haven't come to realize that all of this that we're witnessing is grounded in this book, you just haven't been, I'm sorry, but you just haven't been paying attention. Your, your affections have been elsewhere, your thoughts have been elsewhere, your, your dreams, your goals, your, your, your delights have been elsewhere. Going back to the beginning of what I said, this book, Dearly Beloved, this book is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. It's not a Boy Scout manual. It's not a computer manual. It's not a self-help book. One of them how, like there's tons of those on, the, on Christian bookshelves, you know, on how to do what I'm saying we, we don't do. Let's conform our lives to this book. And by that, I, I simply mean we, 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 we read it and we do it. Well, Steve, how, how simple can that be? You know, how, how difficult can that be? I mean, it may, in your thinking, not appear to be difficult until you start doing it. You know, by the time you get one little area of your filthy life cleaned up and, and, and begin to take pride in it all, then some other ugly area, uh, uh, area of your life, it, it rears its ugly head, and you've got to do the same thing, deal with that as well. And, th and that's just a perpetual, ongoing... That's, Steve, that's the Christian life. No, that is not the Christian life. Dearly beloved, drop the bricks. Drop the guilt, the condemnation, the worry, the fear, the frustration, the lack of hope. Stop carrying burdens that our Lord never equ and equipped you with, nor, nor intended that you, you bear. I, it saddens me deeply to see Christian after, to meet Christian after Christian after Christian who is carrying burdens that God never intended that they bear. I'm talking about God's people. Dearly beloved, we are nearly seven years away from the Revelation 12 sign and you've seen what's happened. Just here in America, the seven years between the two eclipses. There, so much has happened that Christians have just sort of left it on the back burner of their mind. They've just gone on, they went on and they forgot about it.
There's got to be a glitch somewhere in this. You know, the human mind just can't, typically, it just can't seem to wrap its mind around what lies ahead for God's people. But God has revealed much of it in His Word, and I would encourage you to spend time in it. You will never, ever have in this life a greater privilege than what you have to just hold this book in your hand. Feast upon it. It is transforming. It, and I, you know, that word it, you know, I'm referring to Scripture. He, God, who is the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God transforms our lives, conforms us to the Word through the truth of His Word. That's how powerful it is. It's just as it, the same power that worked to steal the calm sea when God commanded it to be still is at work in your life. If you, and if you are a Christian, God has not ceased working in your life. I don't care what kind of trouble you went out and got yourself into. We don't worship a God who's stops working in our lives when, you know, his children are bad. If anything, he, he might be working a little harder. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Keep looking up. Rest in him. Rest in his love for you. This is the only way that we could possibly ever have love for one another. Thank you for all of your prayers for the direction of this ministry. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.